All right. Thanks again for either coming back or joining us now uh, for our session, uh, Big Changes Brought to You by Little Apps. And I have a very great uh, panelist or a panel here of experts who've been uh, working in the mobile industry and helping their own brands move into this new world that we just discussed. Um, and we're looking at it really from an app perspective and see what uh, they have done. So first speaker is Tia McGuire from the New York Times. And uh, I'll let you introduce yourself. Great. Um, hi, my name is Tia McGuire, and I'm a product marketing manager at the New York Times. And what I wanted to talk to you about today was 10 key trends that we're seeing in the mobile and tablet landscape. So the first trend is actually the tipping point. Um, and whenever an agency or brand asks me about why mobile's important, the first thing I do is point to this statistic that was published last summer that basically says within five years, consumers are going to be connecting to the internet more through their mobile devices than they are through wired computers. This is the exact same statistic that Google quoted last summer when they implemented their mobile first rule, which means that any product that Google produces, they're going to think about how it works on mobile first. They supported that by saying that they're actually in certain countries starting to see search results higher on mobile devices than they are on wired devices. So if you are a brand or agency that's not currently active in the mobile space, um, I ask you to see this tipping point as really a wake-up call and try and find some underperforming dollars and just test and try mobile. So the next trend is actually my favorite because rewind a few years ago, I feel like mobile advertising was kind of stunted by the fact that we only had static banners. Um, the new ad capabilities are a trend that we're going to continue to see evolve. And I won't read through the full list of ad capabilities on the right side, but what I did want to point out was two ads that I think have really redefined a gold standard for innovation within this new platform. The first one is a Ralph Lauren campaign that ran on our iPad app, and it was a shoppable video children's storybook. And if that isn't cool enough, it was narrated by Harry Connick Jr. The second ad is a Visa ad um, that was created by Tina's team over at AKQA. And much to my chagrin, we did not get that business at the New York Times. But I will definitely still hail this as one of the best practices within the industry. So a few things that I wanted to share with you in terms of metrics about how iPad owners are responding to ads. 46% um, actually enjoy engaging with ads with interactive features and 36% have made a purchase as a result of an ad that they've seen on an iPad, which is unbelievable from a marketer's perspective. So the next key trend that we're seeing is really the evolution of metrics, and I'm so excited to see how touchscreens are really redefining our digital vocabulary of click-through rate, because if you think about it on a touchscreen, you can't click through. You can tap through, you can swipe, you can scroll, or you can tilt. Um, so I'm very excited to see this continual evolution of metrics. The fourth key trend is mediation layers and the start of standardization. If you are an agency or media buyer that's trying to execute across multiple tablet apps right now, my heart really goes out to you because no two publishers are doing the same thing in terms of ad sizes and much of the technology that we use to serve rich media has not been standardized. There's a group by the name of Orma that's starting to work through the IAB to standardize some of the basic hooks that we use for rich media. And I'm on the IAB tablet task force. And although I think that standardization is still a couple years away, we are going to start to look at the full page interstitials because we recognize and hear you that you know having to do a custom ad for every single app is not scalable. M commerce and near field communication. Um, this is probably the most profound trend that we're going to see over, over the next year or two years. The article on the right-hand side really shows that people in Japan have been using their phones as credit cards and wallets since 2007, 2008, and pretty massively adopted. Um, we're definitely going to see that as a game changer here in the United States over the next two years. Smart and cool apps. Um, I'm really excited to see what happens in the healthcare industry this year, particularly with personal sensor apps. These are apps that are going to allow you to do something like monitor your sleep patterns or your blood pressure. Um, then there's smart apps. The first um, appliances were already unveiled at CES, 
refrigerators that can communicate with your app on your phone and give you your shopping list. That sounds so George Jetson to me, but I'm totally down to try it. The next key trend, number seven, is content shifting and continually connected experiences. I want to give a shout out to both Dropbox and SpringPad, which are two apps that are doing a great job of this. It's basically being able to start working on a document, say on your phone, and then using the cloud to throw it over to the tablet, and then it's waiting there for you at your computer. The eighth trend, companion viewing and social. Um, the guy that runs the mobile team at the New York Times, when he came back from CES, I was totally dorking out to find out what the key trends were, and I was sure it was going to be about tablets this year. But he said in his personal opinion it really wasn't. He said it was about the TV and the fact that the TV is not a mature product yet. So this, is, this and next year are going to be the year that we really start to see consumers be able to throw content in between their television set and their mobile devices. And you're also going to start to see um, a lot of new companion viewing experiences where entertainment companies are creating something to supplement what you're watching on TV that you'll view through your mobile device. So we've done a lot of talking about mobile and apps, but this ninth trend is really about your triple dove site. Um, Forrester recently came out with this research, and it's something that we're using to inform our product roadmap at the New York Times, and that is only 16% of tablet owners are using apps more than the browser on their tablets. So for us, what does that mean? Obviously, the lion's share are either using it equally or more. And because those pesky non-flash compatible tablets, which are projected to dominate the market for the next few years, are so important to how people are connecting with our content, we're going to be spending a lot of effort optimizing our triple dub site so you can see our video and slideshows and they'll render correctly. So at the New York Times, one of our mantras is really whatever platform you want to connect with our content on, whether that's print, whether that's digital, whether it's mobile, whether it's tablets, we want to be there to provide a premium reading experience for you. That is great in theory, but it, you know, fast forward to the Consumer Electronics Show, it got very difficult this year when over 80 new tablets were introduced, many of them with different operating systems. So we, like most brands, are challenged to figure out how in the world are we going to continue with our mantra. And the answer is this year we're really betting on HTML5 as the source for the apps that we're going to be creating, and hopefully we'll be able to with minor modification, create apps that will scale correctly across multiple screen sizes. I'm going to knock on some simulated wood here for good luck, because it's still in the early stages. Um, I did want to share a few best practices and resources for the brands and advertisers that are currently building apps right now. The first thing is, what makes your app indispensable? Um, there was some research by Forrester that came out that said that smartphone owners, on the average, have 15 apps and use less than a third of them weekly. Tablet owners, on the average, have about 17 apps. So if you were building your app right now, my best practice for you is not to create a digital replica and make sure that you create something that's very highly relevant and straightforward for consumers to use, because your competition is probably the angry bird up there, and that's pretty stiff competition. So the good news is, is that you don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. I would encourage you, if you see an app that's currently in the marketplace right now that has some of the killer functionality that you're looking for, to maybe try and reach out to the people that built that app and see if you can strike a deal behind the curtain to enhance your own app. The next one, you would think it would go without saying that not to forget to promote your app once it's actually built. But I can't tell you how many times we've seen brands spend all the effort building the app and then they didn't reserve budget to advertise it. So not only should you do that, but as a best practice, we recommend a burst campaign in addition to a sustaining campaign. And the reason we recommend that is because the goal is at the beginning um, of the launch of your app, if you can raise enough awareness um, to make it and downloads to make it onto one of the most popular lists, that's sort of the gift that keeps on giving because those lists are critical discovery points for consumers. So maintenance, definitely not the cool or sexy thing, but if you are building an app, it's really critical that you understand three to four times a year you're going to have to update your app to be compatible with the operating system updates that are coming into market. And that's something at the New York Times that we had to kind of um, fine tune in terms of our staffing. 
So I did want to leave you with a few resources today. Um, the first and foremost question that we get asked by agencies and brands is, show us cool, rich media mobile ads. And there's a rich media vendor that I think really has heard this need from the marketplace by the name of Medialets. And they've recently released two different apps. One is on the iPhone, the second one is on the iPad, and they're different. And they're basically a gallery of some of the most interesting rich media executions that are happening in the industry right now. If you want to see this, um, I've got it on my iPhone, and you can come up to me afterwards, or I'm happy to send you information about how to download it. The second resource is the Mobile Marketing Association has an awesome case study library. It's sorted by category, and I try and go check this out one time a month just to see what's new and cool. And the final thing is um, mobilemarketer.com has kind of the daily news about what are the cool mobile campaigns that are going on in the marketplace right now. So that's it. Thanks so much. Is this on? OK. Um, and next, I would like to welcome Patrick O'Neill from Schwab. Um, he's definitely give us a little bit of an insight into the financial industry and mobile. Let me switch this over. Yes, we're going to talk about money. So shifting topics a little bit. Uh, let me just ask a broad question and, and get an interactive poll going. How many people here feel engaged with their money? Really, not many. All right. I can't lower the bar on that one. That's why I'm going to try and raise it, actually. So uh, past knowing uh, what's in your savings account, what's in your, your checking account, how many people know how, what percentage they contribute to the IRA or how their 401K is doing? All right, so a little bit of engagement there going on. Um, how about a stock or fund that you might have bought recently? How's that performing? Kind of, all right? So the point is, uh, money can be a, be a very polarizing thing where some people are downright fanatical about it, some people would rather floss their cat than roll over a 401k. Uh, but we think apps have the power to change the way people engage with their money. So uh, I'd like to... I'm this one, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, take you through a few thoughts here. Um, two specific examples. One, uh, how clients are using uh, apps at Schwab, and one uh, example uh, that might be on a third-party app um, in terms of uh, finding prospects for potential clients. So, um, in terms of clients, uh, we see uh, our client base uh, taking to the app uh, in droves. Now, we certainly weren't the first uh, out of the gate with a client app, um, but uh, they're able to, um, with one you know, swipe or a couple of swipes of the finger, engage with their money in terms of seeing their brokerage, their banking, their IRA, their mortgage, and this is a, a fairly new proposition. Uh, this is not my bank account, by the way. I wish it were. Um, the beauty of this is not only its simplicity, um, but that it's fast and secure. Uh, people in, in, you know, interacting with their finances, it's kind of a scary thing. They want it to be close to their chest. Um, so it's fast and secure, uh, but it's simple. So it removes that complexity barrier that, that sometimes hinder people from interacting with their money. Uh, now, thinking back to when you used to get your statements in the mail, then you had to go to the web, you had to log on, uh, now you can do this, uh, all these transactions, even trade if you, if you want to, uh, in the time it takes to travel a couple floors on an elevator. So we think that's a pretty unique uh, proposition. Longer tail, uh, the more people engage and the, and the frequency at which they engage with their money, uh, they're more likely to stick to an investment strategy uh, and they're uh, more likely to be a loyal customer of Schwab or uh, whatever app they might be using. Uh, speaking of customer loyalty, we're using social, uh, our social channels, to gain input um, for how we can improve our apps, and we're getting a, a lot of feedback, and we love uh, that channel as feedback. And you're going to see a flurry of new releases this summer uh, from Schwab across iPhone, iPad, uh, and Android platforms. So be on the lookout for that. Another quick poll. How many people have been surfing the web in the past 10 years and clicked on a banner and bought a mortgage, bought some life insurance, or uh, anything like that? Not a one. 
Exactly. So we don't expect mobile to be this kind of channel either that's going to be, um, you know, be an acquisition channel for very complex uh, products and services for finance like a 12-year muni bond uh, ladder. <clears throat> so what do we see this uh, doing in terms of gaining prospects on, on apps? Well, we see the ability to provide the same kind of utility and, and help and guidance that you'd find at a Schwab branch uh, on the phone or, or um, online. So here we have a quick example that you might find uh, and, and come across while visiting your favorite uh, third-party media app, reading about the top 10 places to retire. And uh, we've taken this uh, quick calculator off of Schwab.com. We've made it into a, a nice, easy interface with uh, you know, a, a quick touch, add your name when you plan to retire, and get a quick kind of reality check of how much you can expect to take in Social Security uh, when you retire. And it's this kind of help and guidance, little bites of utility that we see apps being able to give us this canvas for uh, and get people kind of uh, past that inertia that's holding them up from getting engaged with their finances. What's more, um, as Tiu uh, mentioned, there's a lot of native functionality that we can use that can continue this dialogue. Uh, everything from a GPS to uh, inform them where the nearest branch might be, to click to call, click to chat, video, email, calendaring. We can um, calendar an appointment right then and there in the app. It's a very powerful prop proposition that we didn't really have um, with uh, display banners. So short and sweet. Um, like uh, many advertisers, we're just getting started and getting our feet wet in the world of apps. Uh, like I said, we see a lot of potential, and we're going to roll out a lot of new functionality this summer uh, for both clients and future clients of Schwab. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, and next, we have Amanda Mehan from uh, Clorox, and she'll uh, give us an overview of what the consumer product space is actually doing in the mobile world. Let me click this out. Oops. I think yours is here. There it is. All right, let me switch this over. Just stay down here. Yeah, you can either do that or use this. Okay. Hi. I'm Amanda Mahan, and I'm going to be talking about the Clorox MyStain app. Um, this is the story of how the app came to be and five things that I learned along the way while making it. So five things I learned along the way while making the Clorox MyStain app. Um, so I started at Clorox about a year and a half ago, and the first thing that I had to do, one of my first responsibilities, was cleaning out all of the crap that the person before me had left in the office. And one of those things was this magnet, and it had all of this great stain removal content on it. And um, I thought, this is really good, but how many people have this magnet? This is such rich content. Um, so I started to look at our other online assets. Information was not there. So then that got me started on a bit of a quest, and I thought, I wonder if people are looking for this kind of content. So I um, did some sleuthing using some Google tools, and I found that tens of thousands of people were searching for stain removal tips every month. And they were exactly the kind of stain information that we had. We just weren't getting it out to them. Um, and the other thing is that many of them were looking for stain removal tips from mobile. And also just knowing the statistics for mobile, I knew that a lot of people in mobile were moms and were young moms. So that was an audience that we wanted to reach. And we knew that mom had a problem. She needed stain removal tips and she needed them on the go. And Clorox had this great content. It wasn't accessible. But in addition to that, we had another problem, which is that we had a perception problem. We are you know, we're going to be 100 years old in 2013, so we're not a cool company. We're not like a hip company. We're not even like retro hip. We're just nothing. <laughs> so we, um, you know, we wanted to get in there with the people, <laughs> the young people, and, and try to um, solve their problem and also solve our, our own problems. So we were hoping that this MyStain app would solve the consumer's problem anytime, anywhere, and also try to make laundry a little bit hip. 
So, um, like, you know, to you mention also don't reinvent the wheel. Same thing happened with us. So we looked on, around and we saw that stain removal apps actually existed. There were a couple. They were pretty dry. They were pretty straightforward. They had similar content to us, but a lot of it was very product centric. So it was using their product always to solve this problem. So we wanted to make ours different, and there were three ways that we did that. One is we wanted to add an interactive game-like component. So um, you've probably seen other apps have the slot machine sort of functionality. So we decided we wanted to use that because that is a code that it's reusable code. So it will keep the cost down of our app. We knew that, and we had a small budget. Um, so we did scenarios where we had um, a person, a situation, and a fabric. So, uh, so what happens is a person could either, they could browse all the stain removal tips we had, or they could search for a stain, but then the other way they could interact with it was with this kind of funny wheel. So you would press a button and it would the slot machine would come up. So in this example, it said dad date pants. And then they got a line that said how to remove soy sauce in this little cute line that says, you know, that's what you get for trying to impress the young girlfriend with a sushi boat dad. And from the family values company to like even admit that mom and dad are not together and that dad's like eating sushi with young girlfriends was just really, really a huge departure. <laughs> and it was a good departure because while that's the reality for lots of people out there, it wasn't anything that we were ever even admitting or talking about. So, um, so that, and that speaks to also the tone. So we wanted to just have some fun with it. We wanted to, to, it to be something that maybe would give someone a chuckle and, and you know, spur them on to share it. Um, the other thing that was different is that once you got to the steam removal um, tip, we had on the go information. So we, we knew that people were looking from their mobile app. They're in there, you know, obviously they're, they're accessing the content from mobile. And so we wanted to be able to give them a solution right then and there. So we, we of course talked about our products. If when you get home, you're going to use our products, but when you're on the go, you're not, you don't have your, our products with you. So we gave them just common sense tips that they could use. And those, that was a huge differentiator too, from what was already in the market at the time. Okay, the humorous tone was really actually a huge thing for us because even before the app was in the market, people were calling for interviews because they wanted to talk about what we were doing and they had heard about this app. Um, after we got into the market, we got into publications that we had never been in before. So we had been in People, we had been in Redbook, um, paid, but this was unpaid. So we were featured in four apps we're loving, we, all, all different kinds of publications, places that we would we had never in like the history of the company been in without having to to buy an ad there. Um, and then also we think because of the tone and the kind of fun aspect of it, it got people sharing. So 50% of people who downloaded it shared either through Facebook, Twitter, or email. They shared the app or individual tips. And we, um, we tried to make it really easy. So you just clicked a button and you could, you could push out any kind of content because we wanted it to be, we wanted people to share it with other people, obviously. So the third thing I learned is that you want to think big, but it's okay to start small. I think a lot of times when agencies come in and they pitch you on this really cool augmented reality thing starring a basketball player or whatever, you know, and it's like hundreds of thousands of dollars, it sounds awesome, but who has that kind of money and who can convince brand people to spend that kind of money? Not a lot of people, right? So we had a very, um, you know, our spend was so small, they call it a rounding error at Clorox. <laughs> it was really not a lot of money. And so, um, and that was fine because once we got the content together and once we got the app made, to then do versions of the app was really just incremental, nominal incremental spend. So first we did iPhone in English, then we thought it's easy, let's just make Android. It was easy to convince people to just throw in a few, you know, thousand dollars to make another version. Then we wanted to do, we should do Spanish for the US market. So it's, you're taking the exact same experience, you're translating into Spanish and you're adding, you know, you can see a different imagery. Um, but we ended up having all all of these different assets out of one asset because we were able to just repurpose and recycle the content in different ways. So the fourth thing that I learned is that apps can start a dialogue. Um, you know, you think of app as just like pushing information out to the user, and it is, but 
the other thing is that you can learn from it as well. And I think that um, when we think of dialogues, we think of social, right, where you're on Facebook and you're talking to your customer and you're on Twitter and you're having one-on-one -on -one conversations. We actually learn a great deal, though, from our consumers by watching and tracking their behavior in the app. So we know everything that they're doing, how much time they're spending, what they're looking for, what they search for that we don't have, and we're taking that information and we're using it. So um, at the blue, I got a phone call from Julie in R&D. She's now my best friend. She calls me every month and she wants to know what, what are people looking for, what are the top searches, and she's mining through the data. Um, they're really going to use it to help drive product development. So if they find, for example, that, you know, baby puke is really popular, <laughs> they might develop a wipe that can deal with baby puke on the go because that's something that they know people want. They really want to, you know, develop products that people need. So they're using this as one of their inputs. Um, also, we found, for example, that uh, wine stain was really big. So now we're using wine stains in our ads because the, um, we know that that's something that's resonating with people. Um, we, knew, we found that people, one of the number one things people were searching for was taco grease. And we had that stain removal tip, but we just didn't have it in the My Stain app for the initial run, so we added it. So those kinds of things are really kind of permeating through the company and companies using the information to, to push product development and marketing and claims. So I thought it was funny because you had Angry Birds too, but <laughs> I think the fifth thing that I learned is that you have to set reasonable goals. So you're not going to get 10 million downloads unless you're doing Angry Bleach Birds, and we're not. <laughs> so the, you know, the thing that... Um, that I think people sort of are always like, well, how many downloads can I expect? What's the ROI? And that's not always like the best way to look at it. First of all, the app itself is not going to drive traffic. You have to have drivers that go to it. And um, traditionally, you have to have something that exists before people in the media group are going to get excited about driving traffic to it. So you want to um, think about other goals. And other goals can be reaching new targets, which is something that we did. I, I talked about reaching young moms. Um, the other thing is changing perceptions about your brand. So it was interesting because I just saw this social listening report um, yesterday, and they had, you know, they talk about our share of voice and who, what people are talking about when they talk about Clorox. And one of the huge things that popped up was stains. And a year and a half ago, that, that was not even on the map. So it really has changed people's ideas of what, where they can go for solutions. Um, and, and the sentiment was in a positive light, which was really good, because that means that we are doing what we set out to do, which is solve their problems. Um, getting buzz, I mentioned, that's a lot of the social and the sharing and being in people and being in Red Book. And then the last thing that I think is really important is that we created something that employees can love. When you have this new generation of you know, young people coming right out of business school and they're coming to Clorox and they're searching for signs of life, because it can get pretty boring, you know, pushing cleaning products. And here's an asset that they can download onto their iPhone that they already have and share with their friends. It's something that they feel is cool and that they can feel proud of. And once we created the asset, it really took off in terms of just people heard about it, they wanted to get involved, they wanted to do stuff. We did summer stains, we did holiday stains, and it's, it's not only changed, you know, how we did an app, but it changed back, you know, back on the ranch, what we did with, like, our voice and the way that we talked about stuff and the imagery that we used, because we changed the way that we talked about our, our solutions. We before, it was always about, like, here is how you use bleach and use a third, three quarters of a cup. And this is our product uh, instructions. And now we're talking about it as a solution to mom's problem. And that was just a, a huge shift and a shift in the way of thinking. And when we do DNA work, brand DNA work, you know, when they talk about what are the things that we like, that we feel good, that feel like the future of the company, this is the top thing that they think about. So it really is at the core kind of changing our brand DNA. Um, and then, you know, most importantly, our CMO, who I don't even think has an iPhone, said that it was totally awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so those are the five things that I learned. And, you know, hopefully this app helped make our company just a, a teeny bit cooler. Thanks so much, Amanda. And then uh, last but not least, we have Scott Jumbo from Open Table. Switch this. Oh, 
Oh. I'm going to start with a uh, quick video here. If I can figure this out. If you can book dinner on open table or a flight on Southwest or United Online, then why shouldn't you be able to make an appointment at your local Social Security office the same way? So um, I'm going to start every meeting at Open Table with that exact <laughs> video. Um, I just, it has nothing to do with mobile. I just happen to think it's pretty cool that Obama said Open Table on a uh, press conference. Um, let me get this back up here. How do I? I'll just close this out. Oh, great. Okay, so um, putting mobile on the menu. Um, going to talk a little bit about Open Table and our approach. So back around uh, the year 2000, if you can remember that far back, we launched our first mobile app. Um, anyone in here have the uh, Palm Pilot? Yeah. So I'd like to thank the man back there for being the only one to book a restaurant reservation on the Palm Pilot app we developed. Um, it was a slow start for Open Table, and I think we were a little bit early. Um, needless to say, what you've heard today, uh, both in uh, the presentation before this and, and with my colleagues, um, we have seen a tremendous uptake in mobile and what mobile means to our business. Today, um, mobile is actually driving about 10 percent of online reservations for Open Table. So that's a huge number, and we've made a huge commitment to mobile. Um, we've seated 7 million diners, actually more than 7 million diners, through mobile applications alone. Um, we've generated over $350 million in restaurant revenue for our restaurant partners through those reservations um, that were seated at the restaurants. Um, we, we, unlike many companies, have gone very broad in the number of mobile products we've developed. So you can see here we've got a suite of about seven different platforms and a mobile optimized website that we've launched to date. Now, we're not actively supporting all of these and re releasing new versions. Um, we're working on the ones that we've seen a lot of uptake in. Um, we didn't create all of them ourselves. Some were created by partners for us. But, um, but I think what, um, what you can see is that we recognize that this is a whole new way that people want to interact with our brand and our product. Um, and so we, we've, uh, we've seen tremendous, tremendous response. Um, just in terms of timeline, we launched our mobile website in May of 2008. And since then, every few months, we've been adding on to our mobile suite of products. Um, and as we add on to more and more products, we're seeing more and more engagement. We define our business by the number of diners seated, so that's what the metric is there. One neat thing about it is it's a new point of love that our customers have for Open Table. There's one uh, tweet up here about how uh, someone loves having Open Table in their purse. Um, I think that's just a great example of a way that it's built a new relationship with someone. We used to be just a relationship they had at their desktop, and now all of a sudden we're in their purse, which is a pretty intimate place for many people. Um, and it, it's a good indication that we've, we've gone to a new height with our brand. It's also a good indication that they're telling other people about it because they're proud to have that, and they're using Twitter and other media to do such. Um, it also creates incremental booking opportunities. So for us, this is uh, great news for our own revenues as well as our restaurant's revenues. I like to use the movie theater as a good example um, to think about incrementality. Uh, before mobile, you used to walk out of the movie theater. You were hungry. You had a little popcorn. But you looked to the left, and you saw a Chinese restaurant. And you looked to the right, and you saw a diner, and you said, that, where can I eat? Um, today, you walk out. You open your mobile, your mobile app. You press what's around me. And all of a sudden, you have the 50 closest restaurants that have reservations for you within minutes. You secure a reservation, you get a map, figure out how to walk there, and you're there. So it's greatly changed. And so you can imagine in the past, someone would have just walked into a restaurant or a diner, and maybe not even a reservation-taking restaurant. And now today, they can eat at the restaurant of their choice that can accommodate them at that very moment. So it's a pretty neat example of how it's incremental. We've also studied how people prefer to use our products, whether it's our website, whether it's our mobile sites. Um, and we've seen that when they're doing different things in their lives, they prefer different uh, products, whether it's our apps um, or our desktop applications. So um, it's really important to understand this because these are all new different interactions you have, and it drives frequency and engagement if you are giving good uh, experiences across the board here. Um, another thing, this is a little bit hard to read here, but another thing, this shows the difference in uh, the time between when the reservation is booked and when the reservation is seated. 
which I think is pretty cool to look at and see. The green line shows that within the last 24 hours, actually within the last four hours, many more reservations are booked on mobile than on the desktop. That's not surprising, but it shows that there's new use cases where they would have been away from their computer, not able to book a reservation that they're using this. And so studying and understanding how people are using your products, your mobile products, and understanding when they want to use them really will help you decide how to develop products and, wh and where to go with your mobile products. The next um, one I would like to share, uh, now I'd like to just share a couple of things we learned along the way that hopefully will help you all with this. So um, the first thing we did was we looked at our own website. Forget building apps until you've taken care of your own website. And make sure that your website that you spend a lot of time and energy building um, works well on mobile devices. And so here's an example, not Open Table, but it's a restaurant partner of ours. They built this great website. It's got a video on it. It's got the faces of the folks there, a lot of uh, photographs, um, a lot of care about this family restaurant that people discover them on the web. This is what they see. Well, this is what they see when they open up a browser on an iPhone for that website. So if you haven't done this audit and you haven't found your website on all these different devices and looked at what you're, re what you're rendering right now, um, you're missing out on a tremendous opportunity for engagement. So um, this is another example of another restaurant that did do that exercise. Now they came up with this mobile, simple mobile website. Not the sexiest thing in the world, but I would argue that about us, directions, contact us, reservations, and about the location that they're in are the main use cases that people are using when they're going to uh, a browser on a mobile device looking for a specific restaurant. Not the fancy music or the video or the pictures. They want to know how to get there, what, what's on the menu, and how to make reservations. The second thing, I heard a lot talk about advertising and advertising your app. I would say the first thing you should do is make sure everyone that's already using your brand um, that you're marketing to them first. So start with your install base of users. We're lucky we have a few million people that use OpenTable on a regular basis. Um, and our goal was to get those folks to use our mobile apps first and foremost. Um, we talked about in incrementality. So you can imagine if you get everyone that's already using your brand to use your mobile site that they're using it more, which means you're getting um, more money or views or whatever you define your business as. So we did things like we merchandised mobile very prominently on our high traffic pages. We sent out dedicated emails to our diners. Um, we continue to do so on a regular basis. Um, we added to our header and footer on our website mobile, because we know people are looking for it there. And we leveraged our social media and our blogs and, and our partners that um, would help us spread the word that way to our existing customers. The second thing we did is we made sure that the folks that were looking for us on mobile would find us and would find our apps in specific, because we thought they provide great experiences. So this is an intercept you get when you open up your Safari browser on your iPhone, you type in www.opentable.com. Instead of going to our regular website, you get this, and it says, hey, nice iPhone. Why don't you download our free iPhone app? So again, I think this is just a good example as um, you're thinking about how, what kind of experiences you deliver to people. Don't forget the people that are already looking for you. This is a cheap way to find new customers in that way. And you also give them the option to go to your opentable.com website if they really were looking for your web experience on their, on their mobile device. Um, the next one, and I think this may be the most important, is don't forget to embrace feedback and staff to respond to feedback. So we answer every question that comes into us about our mobile products. The mantra I use is usually um, uh, pretend that you're teaching them how to use the phone, not how to use your app. Most of the people that are writing in questions about your app are just learning how to use a smartphone. And so the questions may not have anything to do with your app. They might have to do with how their BlackBerry won't let them display apps or how their, their um, Android is not rendering properly because it's a certain type of device. There's tons of uh, different kinds of feedback that'll come in. And if you're helping them solve those problems, your app becomes more and more important than they think um, you're helping them get better at using their phones. People are really proud about their phones and they get really frustrated when they can't do that. So we have dedicated people that answer these questions. We log. Um, what they're asking about, and it goes into our roadmaps, and it helps us prioritize the things that we need to update about our apps. So um, those are some of the things that we learned along the way. Uh, I'll close by saying the last thing we did is we, we really demonstrated the power of the platforms that we were on. And we've seen um, the fortune of being marketed by uh, the handset devices, the platforms themselves, because we hopefully showcase what they can do, whether it's the GPS capabilities, um, or whether it's the transaction app capabilities, et cetera. And so I'll show you one example of that, which I think is pretty neat. 
So don't forget to do the fun, interesting things that the folks with all the advertising money um, uh, can, can expand your brand and, and showcase your brand here. So hopefully. Wow, I'm sick of these drones. Alec, use your LG Ally smartphone to find a local crowbar shop. Something to pry open this flaming car. Andy, use yours to get on Google Latitude and find out if we have any strong friends nearby. Jen, download some cool rescue music. Okay, get on eBay and bid on a car that's not upside down. No, Jen, too obvious. Upload that to Facebook. Check open table for dinner reservations. I want tacos, but I won't force it on you. But I kind of deserve it, because I'm kind of doing all the work here. I need you now. Jen, you're really not good at this. What, what about me? Hey, buddy, I just need you to do one thing, OK? Use your LG ally to take a YouTube video of me standing like this with the flames in the background because girls like guys who stand near flames. Is it a lifesaver? The new LG ally smartphone. So is it a smartphone or something better? All right, so that's all I have. Hopefully it was a little insight about how open tables approach mobile and some of the things we've learned along the way. Thanks. Just stay here. All right, I'd love to... Uh... Have you all come back up here? Um, and I'd like to open it up to the audience to really ask questions uh, to our esteemed speakers here. And uh, hopefully, they have all the answers that you were always looking for. So, yes. So let me just repeat the question. It's, it's basically all about how, what do companies do, what do brands do to keep people engaged with the app so they're not dropping off after the first time or the second time they're using the app? Well, for us, we add new content all the time and new functionality. So we're constantly thinking of new stains, and we try to do it at times when it makes sense. So in the summer, we're doing summer stains. In the holidays, we're doing holiday stains so that um, when they're searching for it, because we also we do a lot of search promotion too, so when they're searching for that kind of stain, our solution will come up. So um, they may have the app already and continue to reuse it, or it might catch new users. So basically, ditto. Um, we continue to introduce new content and functionality, such as blogs, rethinking about slideshows, and work really closely with our information architect to make sure that it's a seamless experience. Um, so I think uh, in addition to that, I mentioned that you need to try to really make sure that the app has information that becomes indispensable over time. So, you know, dining history, the ability to change your reservations or cancel them at the last minute, um, things that uh, will, that they, functionality that they're using on a repeated basis on the web or content that they're, in, that they're using on the web, um, just enable them to use it on your mobile devices and that way um, they'll check back with, with your mobile devices when they're not near a computer. So. Last point, if relevant, using the push technology that's available. So for, for banking and, and brokerage, we can establish alerts that'll remind people if they reach a certain limit, um, you know, if a stock hits a certain price, et cetera. So those uh, alerts really help pull people back in for increased usage. All right, anybody else? Yeah. So the, the question is basically all around how, what has changed from you know, coming from, this, from the regular phones to the tablets now? Is there a new approach? Is there a different approach, different designs, and so forth? Um, so for OpenTable, we have a, ma a much more map and photo-centric iPad app um, than we do on the, uh, the other um, mobile phone uh, apps that we have. That's the only tablet app we have to date, um, but hopefully we'll be looking at some new ones as well. Um, and, you know, I think you also have to ask uh, why you're on a tablet versus on the phone and what you hope to achieve. 
some analysis around what rooms or what points of people's lives they use this, uh, they use tablets versus their phones um, are interesting and we think about what does open table mean in the kitchen on an iPad app versus just in your pocket, so. Um, so we do think of them as, as very different devices and we work with our information architect to design appropriately. Going back to how people are using it on the phone, it's much more of, you know, filling a pocket of time and we're seeing usage on tablets being much more of a leisure experience and being more concentrated in the mornings and afternoons, whereas mobile's pretty consistent throughout the day. Um, I agree with Tina that for me personally, tablets are still part of the mobile family, but in terms of how we design and approach it, um, it's very different. Yeah, I would just add, when we made um, our app, which was not that long ago, iPad didn't, wasn't even here, <laughs> so we didn't really think for that, but we have explored now doing versioning for iPad, and, and one of the things that we would consider is, uh, is um, adding some rich media, because it could handle that better and display better, but also just the swiping and the, the, the ways that people interact with it, we'd want to make sure that we are in line with that. Yes. So what, what are the, the KPIs, so to speak, for, for mobile apps and what kind of tracking solutions maybe are you using or how do you use tracking? Well, for me, I was lucky because they hadn't done an app before, so they didn't know any better. <laughs> so, I mean, we were sort of the benchmark and now I think any app that comes after this one, because we have tons of brands, so any of the other brands that are going to do an app, they would have to use this as a benchmark, but I think it depends on so many things because it also depends on who your audience is and how much they interact, if it's men, if it's women, if they're what age and everything. So I don't think there's any kind of like standard, I mean, you all might disagree with me, but I, for me, I don't know that there's a standard like way to say this is how much you should expect to get. Um, I think you know, basically you just want to keep increasing and improving and for us one of our main goals was, as I mentioned, sharing. So, and that we accomplished by making sharing really easy and encouraging them to share all the, the way through. Um, so for us, I, I guess I just wanted to focus a little bit more on the advertising side of things because the metrics are changing so much and I will be the first to admit our cranky old um, proprietary ad server addicts can't track um, swipes, tilts, and whatnot, so we are really relying on our rich media vendor to provide that, and we've been doing kind of that as a test and learn, and I've been trying to do A-B tests between online off-rating, which I can track on my end, and I think that that's pretty, pretty accurate so far. Um, I guess it depends on what you're trying to measure, so I think there's two buckets of stuff. One would be business metrics, so how does someone using an open table mobile product compared to someone that's just using the web, compared to someone that's using both. So looking at how that plays into lifetime value metrics, um, is, is, it, is it adding value to, to that, and is it worth acquiring them at a different rate or price? Um, so that's hard, um, cobbling our existing measurement systems with mobile measurement systems to be able to get to that. Um, looking at what the um, number of reservations and the reservation frequency per user, um, number of active users, um, et cetera, and cobbling a lot of that information together. On the second side, there's uh, the product side, which is you think about how you track um, users on your own website, and you look at funnel metrics, where people are spending time, where they're falling out. Um, there's a, when we first started, I think Flurry was the first one that was um, enabling people to do a lot of those product-based metrics. Um, now there's a host of other um, folks, including Omniture, if, if you use Omniture, um, that do enable that. Um, it's really important because people will fall out of the funnel um, or get stuck or close your app at, at a lot different places than they will on the web. And so as a product manager, you want to be able to make sure that the architecture and the flow of your site is, is really optimized. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, from my perspective on the ad side, I think I'm in probably the same boat you are. We're just getting our feet wet with that. Uh, so I can't speak too much to that, um, but on the client side, uh, it's, it's nice for us and maybe a few more that we have our install base downloading the app so we can tell uh, ages, we can tell if they're an active trader versus a, a kind of a, a bank client and we can slice and dice usage 
uh, by those categories, and that's a really nice thing to have and um, you know, dial up functionality based on uh, the drop-off patterns, et cetera. So uh, real benefit there. Um, I think to, to add to that, um, they're, they're basically, the, from just my past experience in working in mobile, they usually, I, I would say, like three buckets when you look at apps. So one, you have the hard numbers of downloads that a lot of people take as their success metrics, right or wrong, uh, still out there, depending on you know, what really your goal is. Um, the second bucket is really the usage of the app itself, really understanding do I have repeat usage, what are the features that my apps, uh, uh, what are my consumers are using in the app, to then also make smart decisions of in what direction do I drive the app. And then I think the third thing, and, and that's something that also Amanda brought up, is general perception of the brand. So just in general, like some of the brand statistics that you get from user studies specifically around Wow, so having an app, for example, does that ra raise now the brand perception I have of Clorox? Do I now move up the brand into a more cutting edge um, brand category in that sense? So I think those are all, they never forget also the soft factors that play into uh, when you're creating mobile experiences in general. So these are kind of the, the three bigger buckets that we usually look at when we, uh, when we look at success metrics uh, for any kind of mobile experience. Anybody else? Yes. So in-house development versus third-party partnering um, of development for the apps. Uh, we took it out, out of the uh, house. Yeah. Uh, the vendor, vendor is the outhouse, yes. <laughs> vendor is escaping me at the moment, sorry. Yeah, it'll come to me. Um, so we have uh, uh, mostly used uh, um, partners to build our apps. Uh, unfortunately, many of them keep getting bought up after they build our apps. Um, <laughs> you've seen companies, um, a lot of uh, non-app building companies buy this um, because finding people that have experience to build these to hire in-house is very difficult at this time, given the demand for that. So um, a, lot of, a, a lot of brands have just resorted to buying small app companies. So um, we continue to, to use a blend of in-house and, uh, and folks from vendor partners. Um, we're, uh, you know, we haven't really talked much about the mobile website side of things and probably have left that out a little bit because apps are so sexy, but um, you know, we're, we're in the process of continuing to evolve our mobile site, which is m.opentable.com, and, uh, and I think that you know, is, is a little bit even more core to what we do, because we believe a lot of people are gonna find us through mobile SEO and, and through mobile search, and, and so um, that one we're building in-house um, versus some of the other ones that we, we have built through partners. So we primarily develop in-house um, on occasion. We have worked with external vendors, and I think it's just really important to take a look at um, how you're staffed and where people's strengths are, and also which OS are you gonna be trying to design for and make sure it's a good match. Um, for Clorox, we partnered with an agency called Boldium, B-O-L-D-I-U-M. <laughs> and um, they did all of the design work and um, the, all the coding, but we did the writing in-house because we really wanted, as I had mentioned, wanted to change the tone and the way that we talked about things, and we sort of knew what we wanted, so we did it ourselves. Hmm. And you had another question? Thank you. <laughs> Question for OpenTable, do you have recipes yeah. on your app? Uh, we don't, um, and uh, we, um, we're we looking at, we, we know that not everyone that cooks, um, especially people that hang out at recipe sites necessarily are great um, overlap with the folks that are dining out the most. Um, so we, we don't have recipe content on OpenTable and we don't have it in our app right now. Um, we are looking at as many ways to build um, additional interesting browsable content besides just our transaction both on our website and in our mobile products um, most of which though is related specifically to the restaurants and the restaurateurs that are featured in that
So the, the question is, is there an, an update strategy in place for all of you guys? Um, you know, it's not that uh, inexpensive if you're using an out um, a developer from a vendor partner to continue to update your apps. You have to make a decision if you're going to make a bunch of small updates or major updates. Small updates that don't impact the user experience that much can be a bit disappointing, even if you get someone to open it, um, versus larger ones will take more time uh, and be bigger gaps between those releases. I think um, one of the things that's frustrating about mobile development and some of the platforms and, uh, versus others is that we got really used to this test and learn mentality on the web of just throw it out there, see how people are using it, A, B it, and you know, create um, a really quick turn on uh, optimizing and enhancing uh, new features or removing them and changing and testing. That mentality is still having trouble getting its way into um, mobile and mobile apps in particular, and so you lose the ability to do that a lot. And so it, that, that's a bit frustrating, I think, for me. Yeah, I would say um, the updates we have coming out are fairly significant, plus for our um, situation we're dealing with highly um, personal data, so um, it kind of keeps the security fairly tight and, um, you know, it gives us a chance to kind of gather our, our um, troops and really uh, do better marketing each time that uh, the new features come out. Um, so we really try and roll our updates um, together so you don't get pinged all the time. When it is a major update about features and functionality, we also complement it with a house marketing campaign to let people know that there's a new version. Yeah, we basically do the same. I mean, the, the main thing that we do is add new content, as I said, and that we try to group it, but it also depends on our claims because they're very strict about what we're, we say we're allowed to do, you know, what we stands we remove and everything what we're allowed to do. So we kind of, it takes a little bit longer of a process than we would like. <laughs> All right. Yes. So the question is around mobile marketing strategy and how you basically, you know, what kind of mobile strategies do you have? You know, what kind of media do you use? How do you, how do you market yourself? Um, well, or even within, I guess. Um, <laughs> well, one thing I would say that we are now offering and that we also utilize to promote um, our iPad app is on our Triple Dove site. We're starting to offer the ability to target. Um, iPad users that are using the Safari browser. So if you're a brand and you want to advertise your app, that's a you know a great solution because it's a targeted audience that you're you're going to reach. Um, so on the publisher side, we're actually not publishing ads in our app right now. Um, we, that probably will change. Um, we're a transaction funnel for the most part, so we don't want to disrupt that too much. Uh, but there are parts of our app that that potentially could be monetized. We haven't uh, we haven't launched ads in in, in the apps at this point. Um, as far as how we um, advertise our apps, we, we've done some uh, paid acquisition for downloads and tested some of the different uh, platforms that are out there for that on a CPA um, or CPC, but we ultimately measured on a CPA basis um, and had some limited success. We have um, you know, pretty small revenue events when people book a res restaurant reservation, so it doesn't lead a lot of money for us to do major uh, acquisition campaigns, but we've done some burst campaigns, like I think someone mentioned, uh, for some of the platforms that value um, the rate of downloads, uh, and we've tested that to see how we can enjoy um, kind of sliding back to the organic position that we have in the stores and the benefit from that. And then we've done some other ones where we've We've um, tried some ones that will guarantee or uh, present us with a fixed price acquisition and to see, to see how those scale. We haven't found great scale on those yet, so. All right, we have one last question. Yes. So, so what are some of the learnings when you just launch the app? How do you get this burst and how do you get it out there to as many people as possible? And then obviously, you know, what are some tricks to get on the top download lists? 
Um, well, I think if you're going to spend money doing it in a burst fashion when you first launch might be a good idea for, you know, I know for Apple in particular, um, that seems to work pretty well because uh, they, they, I believe they do use the rate of download um, over, over a week or two. Um, two, uh, installed base marketing, as I said before, which is promote the heck out of it to the people that are already interacting with your product or brand because um, that will drive a lot of value, uh, volume. Um, uh, I think uh, you also can think about if there's promotions or other ways in which you can help spread the word virally about that. Um, we've done a fair amount of promotion in our blog and on our, on our social media sites and tried to do small contests and such to, to engage people through that. Um, anyone else have? Well, the first thing I would do is just promote the heck out of it internally and get people excited about it internally because you would be surprised at how many properties and assets and stuff that you don't even think about that you have, getting your community manager on Facebook to get fired up about it and on Twitter. I mean, all, just everywhere that you can. Um, we even had um, a Clorox 2 See to Believe tour and then they made a banner that said download our mobile app and they toured the entire country and they had it out there. And that's something that wouldn't have happened except we were just like, well, can we do with this? How else can we promote it? And so you just, I think you just have to be an evangelist for it and really push it and you be excited about it and get other people excited about it. Also, if you spend a lot of money with Google search, they might feature it for you. <laughs> um, so our house marketing campaigns it actually include print when we have a major overhaul for one of our apps. And we also try and cross market to say, our iPhone newsreader app, if there's a major update, will leverage inventory in the Scoop NYC, which is also an iPhone app or the real estate app to promote that as well. Um, in certain cases, we've even advertised outside of our own channels, and I, I think that's definitely a best practice to consider as well. I'm fortunate not to have this issue because we communicate directly with our clients, so directed email. Um, one thing I forgot is uh, um, blogger outreach, I think, can be really important, um, both uh, technology blogs as well as um, stuff within your industry. Um, they spread, they help really spread the word. There's tons of, like, great new app review sites and, you know, top apps for X um, uh, sites out there, um, besides just the mainstream media, which you also should pay attention to, um, to get some cool coverage like, like Clorox did with, the, with people and others. But, but I... Are, are there any websites or, I guess, mobile sites that increase uh, the download possibility more than others? I, I can't think of any that I'd, that I'd recommend over others. It probably depends what your industry is and site type is. Mm -hmm. No, but that's an awesome idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thanks, thanks to you guys for, for being here today and sharing your experience. And thanks for you to joining. Uh, us here, and I think there is a ton more mobile stuff coming uh, later today. Thank you. <laughs>